Manuscripts and inscriptions have been part of our daily lives from the invention of writing until today. Traditionally, studying a written artifact means studying its content, but also its material, layout, script, and many other elements tell stories about its production and use. The Center for the Study of Manuscript Cultures at the University of Hamburg uncovers these stories, created at different times and places. In the cluster of excellence, understanding written artifacts, scholars and scientists from almost 40 disciplines reveal the secrets of these artifacts. My name is Ivan Shevchuk and I'm an imaging technician here at the University of Hamburg at the Center for the Study of Manuscript Cultures. My main job is to recover lost and erased writing in cultural heritage objects. Multispectral imaging is a remote sensing technique. We are able to collect information from the objects, from manuscripts, without touching them really. Therefore, it's non-destructive, non-invasive, and of course our system is mobile. It needs to be because we need to go to libraries where the manuscripts are. So the ink is invisible to our eyes, but there are uh, tiny remainders of the ink which are still in a parchment, which we cannot see, but when we use the LED panels to project uh, light, which is invisible to us, for example, like UV or the infrared, we can make these remainders of the ink visible again and readable and take the images and analyze the data later in image processing to recover the writing. My problem is I cannot read the ancient text or even Latin. I can read MATLAB code, uh, but, but, but not the, uh, the manuscripts. And so I don't know where to look for. Uh, I maybe have uh, now, with experience, a bit better understanding what, what's needed, but ultimately uh, I need guidance from the scholar. My name is Andreas Janke. I'm a musicologist and I have a project on late medieval music manuscripts uh, in Italy. There are some more notes here, but mm -hmm. uh, actually uh, we believe it's the same piece. But to understand this, we need to read the rest here. Otherwise, it will not be possible to say if, if it's the same piece or not. Yeah. The manuscript we were talking about um, is the so-called Atri fragment. It's the remnant of a music manuscript by Antonio Zaccara da Teramo, a very prolific Italian composer from the late Middle Ages. It's just one leaf and one side is legible and the other side is not legible because this fragment has been used two times by bookbinders. The fragment was discovered 45 years ago, more than 45 years ago, and uh, what we can read is just the beginning uh, of the piece, and it says, uh, Bello Sadio. So we know there is some writing, but we actually cannot read it. And uh, so with the multispectral imaging camera and the processing, we are then able to recover this. I'm a researcher at the French National Center for Scientific Research. And I'm what we call an assayologist. It's not a very common <laughs> discipline. We are very few in the world, uh, let's say something like 450 people. Uh, the assayologists are historians or philologists, and we read cuneiform clay tablets, uh, objects like that. And uh, these were uh, written in the ancient Near East. 
The script is called cuneiform, and this script was invented around 3400 BC and was in use in a very large area of the Near East covering uh, Iraq, Iran, Syria, Turkey, and other countries around, and was in use for more than 3000 years. So the Assyriologist read the text, and then from the the reading of the text, we reconstruct the history of the population and civilization which were living in this area. Here we have samples of, of tablets. Uh, some are replicas of uh, real tablets that are preserved in the museums, and some others uh, I wrote myself. Uh, some types of tablets were covered by clay envelope. This is the case for legal text. The envelope gave uh, the, uh, validity the, the, the validity of the the legal validity of the tablet of the contract or uh, any type of legal tablets, and the others are envelopes of letters because these people were writing letters, sending letters away, and they would cover their letters with an envelope like we do today. The envelope protects the tablet itself, its integrity, but also the, it hides the text of the tablet, so nobody can read it except the uh, recipient of the t tablet, of the letter, who would break the envelope to read what is inside. This is an envelope of a contract, Old Babylonian. If they break the envelope, the contract is no more valid. So they need to know what is inside. So most of the text of the contract is copied on the envelope and you don't need to open it. On the envelope of a letter, you have very few texts on it because you have only the name of the sender and the name of the recipient. And then you have several times unrolled like that, so on the surface, uh, the seal of the sender and that's it. So this is extremely frustrating for the seriologist who only have the names, the, 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 the heading of the letter and nothing else. The whole text is hidden. So we had a retreat and I met Christian Schroer. He found the idea uh, really nice and uh, so we built a project together. My name is Christian Schroer. I'm a physicist and a lead scientist here at DESI and I'm responsible for the synchrotron radiation source Petra 3. Synchrotron radiation is generated by very fast electrons that run around in circles with almost the speed of light and they generate the brightest X-rays in the world. The key strength of X-rays is that we can look through things. We do it in radiography when we go to the doctors, but also we can of course look through uh, artifacts, in particular our nice clay tablets. And this gives us the opportunity to look through the envelopes and see what actually is written inside. Colleagues used uh, uh, medical scanners at hospitals to, to scan tablets, but this is possible only for small private collections because you can move the collections outside of where they are kept. But tablets kept in a museum, you don't take them out. This is why we built an instrument that we can bring to the museum to actually do the studies uh, on site. This is our early tomograph that we built some years ago. It is made for much smaller samples and this is why we need to, to build a new one. But yes. the principle is exactly the same. So we have our X-ray source here. You can see it in, in here. Mm -hmm. And the detector on the other side. And this is the rotating table uh, to put the sample on. Now what is the weight of this machine? This machine is also about 300 kilograms. Oh, that's but a lot. <laughs> it's, it's quite a bit. And the machine will come in several parts that you can uh, fix together as a puzzle so you can Put them exactly. in different suitcases? Exactly, so you can basically uh, carry it in smaller pieces and then uh, assemble it and it all uh, uh, snaps into place mm -hmm. so that also the safety issues and everything is taken care of. So the difficulty is to get this shielding done and the shielding is heavy in itself. So we don't use lead but uh, tungsten, but it's similarly uh, yeah, a heavy material. And so the main idea is to build as little of this material as possible and make this instrument as compact as possible. And this is the reason why the instrument is actually rather short. It's less than a meter long and the enclosure is as small as possible. So it's really challenging for the uh, tomographic scanners and for the physicists to try to uh, distinguish uh, between the tablet and, and the envelope because it's the same material. We have basically the same gray value, the same contrast uh, for, from, the, from the envelope and, and the inner tablet, and we have to distinguish between them. And, but uh, so in principle, if there is a small air gap, we can see that by x-rays. And this is, of course, the, the contrast that we use. 
and 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 now it's of course the uh, the challenge of the computer scientist to actually distinguish between the two and identify the outer surface of the envelope the inner surface of the envelope and the outer surface of the tablet and sometimes it's not easy when they really touch we cannot distinguish between them but then we need to find ways of interpolating and in some parts, uh, in some tiny parts uh, that we can also see here, we are actually guessing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Miletus is in actual Turkey uh, on the west coast. And it's a site where one of the biggest uh, cities of antiquity has existed. It's a place where trade routes from Inner Anatolia and the Western Mediterranean uh, connected. Like in many cities in antiquity, uh, Miletus has been equipped with many, many inscriptions. You can imagine inscriptions everywhere on statue bases, on these squares, big uh, letters on buildings, but also small inscriptions, just graffiti written on some columns. Hello, Christine. Hello. I can hear you. Okay. How are you? Well, um, I'm fine. We are all fine. Did you already meet the museum director and the district chief? Yes, of course. We met him at the left side. You can see him. Uh, he's waiting for you. And we met, uh, of course, also the director of the museum, Badan. Mm -hmm. uh, they and he's also waiting for you. For you. That's great. Yeah. Maybe we can visit him yeah. together when, uh, as soon as we come. That's a very. Yes. Uh, that's yeah. very good. That's, uh -huh. that's what we, uh, find. So, uh, did you already um, start to clean a little bit uh, on the site? Yes, we are waiting for you. Mm -hmm. I'm a professor for ancient history and Greek epigraphy, so Greek inscriptions, at the University of Hamburg. I'm an ancient historian, so I'm basically interested in the life of Greeks and Romans in antiquity. So my interest in this research project would be what do the people who visit the theatre of Miletus actually see, uh, how, maybe how would they feel when they enter the theatre, and what's the surroundings for them. Yeah, what I can show you here are so-called squeezes. This is unglued paper that you fix in when it's wet to the inscription, actually. Then you take your brush and then you have a negative impression of the inscription. Once the squeezes are dry, uh, you can transport them, you can store them. That's no problem at all. For instance, these squeezes are about 80, 90 years old. The good thing about this squeeze is that we already see a little bit of the three-dimensionality of inscriptions. You can see how large uh, the letters are, you can see how deep the letters are. What you cannot see is you don't see where uh, in the theater the inscription is. It's only the text and this is uh, the major problem that usually epigraphers work with the text or with the content and not with the whole written artifact. But we want to know where was it in the theater, were there other inscriptions next to it, were there pictorial elements or game boards next to these inscriptions. And so these are things that the squeezes cannot tell me. And therefore I either have to go to Miletus or I can use the virtual reality that we have here. Uh, if you just see, we have um, completed the third, um, mm -hmm. the third um, part of the, the theater here. And you are standing currently on the stage, yes. which would be right behind us at this point. Then we might want to have a look at the panels mm -hmm. here. At the panels in so Jenny, maybe you can zoom into the panel. We have the different colors yes. to show the different kinds of inscriptions. Mm -hmm. So this is something you should pay yeah. attention to. And yeah. also the panels itself, is the size of the panels good enough? Can you read the content? Yeah. Inscriptions in this case provide just the domain 
So uh, typically as professor or researchers in human-computer interaction, we work in some application fields. And in this case, the inscription is just another application field. However, in this case, it's very interesting for us because those inscriptions, um, we consider them in a three-dimensional context. So the interesting challenges arises, how can we display and analyze and develop tools which help the researchers from humanities to analyze those inscriptions in a spatial layout. Well, you have a nice honorific inscription going uh, showing to the front. So um, this has just been cleaned this summer. And uh -huh. then you have the blue, pin, uh, the blue pin and the blue um, bar, which shows you that there is a topos inscription again, which mm -hmm. basically says it's the place of a person called Claudius Aquila. Uh, we've started to wonder when we had your 3D reconstruction here is why would somebody have his inscription there? Why have it somewhere hidden? There is not a lot of people walking by on this side. So who's the audience? Of this inscription. So only people on the stage could actually see and Basically read the inscription. People on the stage so like could us see now. It. Yeah, like <laughs> us now. We analyzed several requirements from um, the experts from archaeology and also epigraphics, um, in which they defined what kind of interfaces they prefer for the interaction, what kind of data should be visualized in the three-dimensional context, how the interaction should be implemented. And this is done in a very so-called human-centered design approach. That is, we iteratively um, analyze those requirements, implement them in prototypes, and then show it to the experts from humanities, and then perceive feedback and iterate and reiterate again until we have hopefully um, some tools which can be really used in a very natural and intuitive way. Just seeing the theater from different points of view, uh, actually points of view which you couldn't enter uh, as a real person, you can basically fly over the theater, and uh, it's a lot of fun. And it's not only fun, but it's fun combined with uh, research. At the CSMC, we are about 150 researchers and more than 50 PhD students from around the world. And also many research fellows, guests and artists in residence. Together, we conduct a wide range of research projects, some of them over a very long time. The Ajami Lab studies Sub-Sahara language in Arabic scripts. Beta Mzahift creates a digital home for manuscripts from Ethiopia and Eritrea. This will take until 2040. We also do a lot of work in the fields cultural heritage and preservation. For example, here in Nepal. Our laboratories include mobile units ready to operate around the world. Also part of the CSMC is the cluster of excellent understanding written artifacts. Another 55 projects are manuscripts and inscriptions with researchers from almost 40 academic disciplines. Humanities, natural science, computer science, neuropsychology, and more. Curious now, we're looking forward to see you.